Welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many um, familiar faces in the audience um, all across the country. Um, in starting out, I'd just like to pay a quick tribute to David Carter, who died a few weeks ago, who was a great friend to us at the project and was great and wonderful research colleague. His um, definitive research on the events before and after and during Stonewall um, is a perfect lead in to uh, the formation of the Gay Liberation Front just a month after Stonewall in July of 1969, which was the first LGBT activist organization formed after Stonewall. Um, it started out at Alternate U, um, which unfortunately we lost the building in the last year, um, which was a counterculture school. And um, GLF was a leftist group that attempted to ally itself with all the other progressive movement, leftist movements at the time, including uh, the Black Panthers, um, the anti-war movement, and so on. Um, five months after GLF was formed in December of 1969, um, a number of members of GLF who became disaffected by the direction um, it was going broke off and formed the Gay Activists Alliance, which throughout this talk I'll refer to as GAA. Um, and GAA's sole focus, unlike GLF's, was, quote, the liberation of gay people, um, as one of the founders said at the time. So um, GLF and GAA, at first, both, both groups and a number of other LGBT groups met in the Church of the Holy Apostles on the left of the screen until um, December of 1970. Um, I, I want to point out, um, because so many groups were meeting at Holy Apostles, it essentially was the first LGBT community center in New York City. Um, in December of 1970, GLF and STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, founded by Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, the earliest trans group, um, the two groups together founded the Gay Community Center on Third Street, seen in the middle um, shot, and um, that was the first all LGBT um, controlled community center in New York, but it only lasted about a year. In the meantime, in May of 1971, GAA opened its firehouse in Soho as its headquarters. And during its years there, which lasted until um, October of 1974, when an arson fire burned them out, it became the most influential um, American gay liberation political activist group of the early 1970s, and the Firehouse became New York's most important LGBT political and cultural community center. In March of 1970, which was only eight months after Stonewall, the police raided an after hours bar known as the Snake Pit and detained 167 men at the local police station. After a young Argentinian immigrant, Diego Vinales, attempted to escape and was impaled on a fence below, GAA and GLF quickly assembled a protest march of about 500 people that same day, going to the police station and then to St. Vincent's Hospital where Diego was, which um, demonstrated an amazing early strength of this brand new movement and inspired many, many more people to become politically active. Various people have cited the success of that snake pit protest as the inspiration for what emerged as GA's most famous effective and imaginative tactic, the so-called ZAP, which was a direct surprise public confrontation with political figures or corporate and governmental entities regarding gay rights and discrimination designed to attract media attention. GAA members Morty Manford and Arthur Evans called it, quote, a hybrid of media theater and political demonstration. Marty Robinson, seen on the right, is generally credited as the driving force between, behind GAA's dabs. Um, as Andrew said, as we're commemorating the 50th anniversary of the first Pride March this month, our project really wanted to take a fresh look at, at the actions of and the locations of GA's first three years. 
many people know about the existence of GAA, but its zaps and actions are not so well known. Um, luckily, um, with so many things being available online these days, um, a number of the contemporary newspapers and newsletters of the period covered the events. There are few written accounts, um, but uh, anyone in the audience were inviting, if you happen to be a GAA member or know somebody who is still with us uh, that was, please get in touch with the project. We'd love to continue to flesh out the narrative of GAA's early years and all of these apps. People have commented forever on the difference between um, the early homophile activist groups like Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Elitists um, represented by the, the picketers on the left um, and, the, and the difference between them in tone and dress style with the post Stonewall activists as captured by GAA on the right. But we have to remember um, how courageous all of these early activists were. They were dressing because they wanted to present themselves as employable and in fact, many of these people lost their jobs because they were out and open and really never were fully employable for the rest of their lives. And in contrast to that, even though the GAA, um, young, slightly younger people um, as represented in this March photograph, um, dis despite their dress and long hair and so on, they were hardly a bunch of crazy hippies running around randomly protesting. What's really fascinating about going through all of their actions is how highly focused, um, coordinated, and targeted they were. Um, and GA really provided a crucial link between the earlier homophile groups and later um, LGBT political action. Um, they continued to increase the public and, and more diverse face of the LGBT community and the discrimination the community faced on all fronts. Among the issues that they addressed, the first one, as we're going through a national dialogue of the um, role of police in American society, it, it will seem painfully familiar, but um, the police um, role in New York was one of the most predominant themes, which included um, arrests, harassment, and entrapment. Um, but also the police's role in the toxic triumvirate with the state liquor authority and the mafia in running gay bars. Um, and also um, other issues were discrimination in housing, employment and public accommodation, anti-gay violence and homophobia in the media, all of which GAA addressed. And I'd like to point out, which Amanda and I were, <clears throat> excuse me, discussing this morning, if you look at Barbara Giddings on the left, her protest sign, which again is 1965, sexual preference is ir irrelevant to federal employment. And we've only gotten a Supreme Court decision yesterday addressing this whole topic. The makeup of GAA ap appears to be, particularly based on photographs and, and looking at some of the lists of members, um, the leadership was mostly white men in the earliest years, but GAA did in fact have a black lesbian caucus and a lesbian liberation committee. Um, surviving photographs also indicate that at events at the firehouses, particularly the really popular dances, there were significant numbers of people of color and surviving photographs of the Zaps themselves indicate that there were some people of color that participated. Um, all of GA's actions also received support from other LGBT groups, including GLF, Mattachine, Daughters of Belitis, and Radical Lesbians. A typical Zap would always feature picketing outside the building, um, confrontations within, whether they were office buildings or public events inside, they always included leafleting, usually included singing of gay liberation songs. And if they were trying to create a festive mood for office workers inside, they usually took a, an urn of coffee and um, donuts or cookies for the office workers. And the media, including newspapers and, and TV were always present so that these would be noticed. 
Um, what I'm going to be presenting now are not all of GA's ZAPs by any means, um, and some of them are not technically ZAPs, they're demonstrations. No one yet has created a comprehensive list of them, and I'm guesstimating that there probably were about three dozen at least. Um, these, the ones I'm going to be showing, which I think are 16 ZAPs and two demonstrations, um, provide a really good window on the types of actions they're doing. And um, a lot of the other ones are very specific against city council members, other people running for office, people running for president that came to New York. And if, um, if GAA members were arrested, they always would have follow-up actions at the courts themselves and, and that kind of thing. So the earliest really public um, GA ZAP was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was celebrating its 100th anniversary. Um, they invited Mayor John V. Lindsay to participate in a morning ceremony on the front steps. GA was absolutely still furious over the raid on the snake pit just a month before and had been trying with no success to engage Mayor Lindsay over the issues of police harassment of and job discrimination against the LGBT community. So they decided to confront Lindsay outside the museum and inside. This turned out to be just a, the first of a very long campaign to disrupt Lindsay wherever he appeared in public. Um, a few days later, after the Met Museum, they um, were about half the audience of uh, the taping of his television show. Um, in September, <clears throat> they zapped the opening of the Metropolitan Opera. And in October, uh, they zapped the Imperial Theater that Lindsay and his wife Mary were attending for a theater benefit to the extent that she was so fed up at all of their um, zaps that she turned around and physically assaulted several of the GA members causing the mayor to have to physically constrain his wife. Uh, the next major zap was at the headquarters of the New York Republican State Committee. And it was a protest of Governor Nelson Rockefeller's quote, crime of silence about gay rights in the state. GAA's six uh, political demands, which are really quite interesting and quite comprehensive, were the repeal of state sodomy and solicitation laws, an end to police entrapment statewide, a state fair employment law banning discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, an end to bonding companies discrimination against homosexuals, an investigation of the state liquor authority, and an end to harassment of gay bars statewide. It, this uh, constituted a seven hour sit in um, inside the offices until the police arrived. And obviously they had a, an extensive picket line after outside. Of the people who remained to um, get arrested, the so-called Rockefeller Five are considered the first LGBT protesters arrested for gay rights in New York City. And they became a, a rallying cause for GAA. GAA led, along with GLF and radical lesbians, a peaceful demonstration on West 42nd Street in Times Square, um, which was a protest over widely increased illegal arrests, verbal harassment, and physical brutality by police against the LGBT community in Greenwich Village and Times Square. After um, circling 42nd Street for a while, the group um, marched down to Greenwich Village, where the crowd grew to about a thousand people since it was a Saturday night and um, there were a lot of people out late. Then a riot developed after police attacked the protesters, both at the Women's House of Detention and at the Haven nightclub on Sheridan Square, which the crowd found that the police right then and there were harassing. Um, th there was another protest the following night and a total of 18 people were arrested. Um, these two nights demonstrated how incredibly volatile the atmosphere still was between the community and police over a year after Stonewall.
GA members received word that the Gold Rail Tavern, a mixed bar and restaurant popular with Columbia University students, had refused service to a gay patron who was expressing affection with a friend. So they held a demonstration of affection where about 50 people crowded the tavern, chanting, leafleting, and kissing. The stunned management apologized and promised never to discriminate again against LGBT patrons in the future. In September of 1970, Harper's Magazine featured on its cover a long, blatantly homophobic essay. And despite their homoerotic cover, uh, the essay, which was titled Homo Hetero, The Struggle for Sexual Identity, um, it presented homosexuality as a mental illness. Around 50 GA members had an all-day sit-in in the editor's offices. This app had a really positive effect in a number of ways. It received much television coverage. And Merle Miller, who was a former editor at Harper's, was so appalled by the article that he came out publicly and wrote his own large, his own long article, What It Means to Be a Homosexual, in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in January of 1971, now considered a landmark of American journalism. He was quoted as saying, I'm sick and tired of reading and hearing such goddamn demeaning, degrading bullshit about me and my friends. January 6th of 1971, two city council members um, entered into the city council what became known as Intro 475 or the Klingon Burden Bill, named after those two council members which was the first attempt in New York City to pass a legislation banning discrimination based on sexual orientation. And I'd like to remind everybody that to New York shame, it did not finally pass a, such a bill until 1986. The Delafax of New York was a private investigation agency accused of gathering information on the sex lives of individuals, particularly LGBT people, or those thought to be, and selling it to prospective employers. The founder, who was a former FBI agent, when asked how he could so identify gay people, replied, quote, if one looks like a duck, walks like a duck, associates only with ducks and quacks like a duck, he probably is a duck. So GAA members managed to get inside the offices and attempted to pay for an investigation of the firm's own head. When the police threatened arrest, they joined their colleagues on the picket line outside, making shrill noises with small squeezable rubber ducks. Obviously, the most noticeable picket member was Marty Robinson dressed in the duck outfit. And as you saw in the, in the clip um, that we were showing prior to letting everyone in, in a really bizarre coincidence, the movie Shaft was being filmed in Times Square at the exact same time. So the opening movie of the, the opening sequence of the movie features actor Richard Roundtree winding his way through the activists, making this virtually unique um, color document of a GAA action. And um, all of you can go on YouTube, the entire opening credit sequence is, is widely available. Uh, we'd like to thank Eric Marcus for alerting us to this uh, sequence. In studying ways to support Intro 475, um, GAA formed a Fair Employment Committee, which conducted res research on job discrimination in the city and found that discrimination against LGBT teachers surpassed that of all other institutions or private businesses. The majority of, of accusations were actually made against the Board of Examiners, which was the agency that controlled the actual licensing of teachers, but the Board of Education had no official policies remain that remained clear as to gay teachers. Um, and GAA's requests for clarification or meetings with the board went unmet, so they zapped the Board of Ed at its headquarters in downtown Brooklyn, finding uh, a very heavy police presence there. 
the group then continued on this issue with the ZAP at the Board of, Ed of Examiners in downtown Brooklyn. And among their demands were an end to discrimination against LGBT teachers, that the board itch, issue such a public policy statement, that fired gay teachers be reinstated, that licenses be issued to teachers who were denied one due to their sexual orientation, and that the board of, that the board of examiners chair resign unless she publicly repudiated her homophobic uh, positions. Five GA members remained here to be arrested as seen um, in the shot with Morty Manford. And the police inspector in charge of these arrests was quite amazingly Seymour Pine, who had been transferred to Brooklyn duty um, after his notorious raids on both Stonewall and the snake bed. The Household Finance Corporation was a major mortgage lender in the city accused of discrimination against the LGBT community by denying credit to gay customers, refusal to hire homosexuals, and conducting investigations into the sex lives of applications for loans and employment. GAA held ZAPs at four of their branch offices, a phoning campaign asking about the firm's policies on loans to and employment of homosexuals, and held a main zap at the head office on Park Avenue. Um, going back to the Church of Holy Apostles, um, ever since July of 1970, uh, the church had been allowing Sunday services of the Church of the Beloved Disciple, a, a quote, a church for gay people. And Father Robert M. Clements, seen here in the middle, um, began to officiate over what he called same-sex holy union ceremonies, which began to attract attention. New York City clerk Herman Katz became incensed and threatened legal action. Though GAA took no formal position on the issue of same-sex marriage or on religion in general, it, consider it considered this blatant discrimination. So they held what became one of their most famous and creative zaps, um, at the Marriage Bureau in the Municipal Building, a same-sex um, engagement party with, complete with wedding cake. Members distributed leaflets throughout the building, inviting city workers to the party. Um, and, uh, and also, Arthur Evans answered the phone and told people calling the Bureau that only gay licenses were being issued that day and they could also come to the party. <clears throat> a, large, a very large community demonstration to protest syndicate domination and police harassment of gays was held by GAA after what it's one of its regular Saturday dances at the firehouse, which ended at 1.30 in the morning. At that point, 1,000 GAA members and dance attendees um, took to the streets behind GAA's banner and walked up to the village and down the length of Christopher Street, picking up an estimated additional 1,000 people who were out late in the village on this, again, Saturday night. Halfway there, they zapped um, the mafia-controlled Christopher's End bar at West Street and seen in this photograph, I believe the man to the second to the right is Mike Umbers, who was the um, mob connected um, owner of the bar. And he had his go-go boys out in front of the bar in support of him. <clears throat> After leaving the bar, they then marched up to the former 6th Precinct Police Station house on Charles Street, seen in the middle and left photos which was the site of where the men arrested at the snake pit raid had been taken. And then they went over um, to West 10th Street on the right-hand shot to the brand new police station, which is still the location of the 6th Precinct. <clears throat> the West Side YMCA on West 63rd Street, like many YMCAs nationally, held a reputation as a very popular lodging and recreation option for gay men. The facility's director, however, announced in 1971 
that any patrons would be rejected for so-called homosexual practices. And he later admitted that his files contained some 1,000 cases of gay men um, being rejected from the Y over the past 15 years. This Y also had regular room checks and residents were evicted if gay literature or any other so-called evidence was found. The number of visitors per room was monitored. Each resident had to keep his door open if he had a visitor after 9 p.m. And they employed informers and installed uh, two-way mirrors in the basement bathroom. The zap here um, consisted of picketing, taking over the cafeteria, shoving flyers under the door of every room, and a sit-in in the lobby. <clears throat> Mayor Lindsay decided to have a kickoff fundraiser um, when he was running for president in 1972 at Radio City Music Hall. And since GAA still considered that he refused to sufficiently publicly back intro 475, they decided to zap the event. They thoroughly disrupted the entire, the entire event by making noise, shouting, and setting off air horns and alarms, handcuffing themselves to balcony railings, and, receive, and releasing hundreds of flyers from the balconies while hundreds of people picketed outside. After the defeat of intro 475 and the city council committee two days later, Lindsay was threatened with protests wherever he appeared around the United States by gay, right, by, by gay rights groups. So on February 7th, he announced an, an administrative directive to protect LGBT city employees against discrimination in hiring and promotion and claimed to be the first American public official to do so. <clears throat> GEA members had just returned to New York City from a large rally held in Albany to highlight the gay rights bills languishing in the legislature when they received a phone call that intro 475 was being ridiculed at an event at the New York Hilton Hotel. This was the 50th anniversary dinner of the Inner Circle, which was a group of City Hall newspaper reporters which lampooned New York politicians every year. So on very short notice, they decided to swing into action and zap the event. They entered the Hilton Grand Ballroom at about 11 p.m. during an intermission of the program and started distributing leaflets criticizing the media's coverage of homosexuals. They were soon re ejected, but as they were departing, a number of GA men were physically assaulted by about a dozen attendees and hotel management. At least six city administration officials who witnessed the event later testified in print or in court that Michael J. May, seen on the left, a former professional heavyweight boxer and president of the Uniformed Firefighters Association, assaulted Morty Manford, who was then the head of gay people at Columbia University. Police refused to arrest May or assist in identifying the other assailants. Seven GA members filed assault charges, but only May was finally charged, but only with a harassment, harassment violation, not an indictment, and he was later acquitted by the judge. The incident and its after, aftermath, however, did garner some of the best media coverage of the early gay rights movement, drawing attention to anti-gay violence and to attempts to pass the city gay rights ordinance. One other huge benefit came from this zap. Jean Manford, seen in, in the middle of the photograph with the sign, Morty's mother, outraged at the police, wrote a letter to the New York Post expressing her love and support for her son. Two months later, as seen in the photograph, she walked in the Christopher Street Liberation Day March, and the unexpected and overwhelming response she received led her and her husband to form pa Parents of Gays today P-Flag in 1973. <clears throat> Mayor Lindsay created the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission in 1971 as the agency responsible for licensing and regulating taxi cabs and other for hire vehicles. 
despite his administrative directive to protect LGBT city employees against discrimination in hiring and promotion, the agency commissioner of taxis and limos required an LGBT applicant to provide proof from a quote certified psychiatrist that he was fit to drive a vehicle. In its staff, GA members dressed up as delivery men and carried a lavender couch managed to get past receptionists somehow and into the commissioner's private office. Then changing into white medical coats, they invited the commissioner to undergo a psychiatric evaluation while people pick picketed outside. The agency then claimed that the incident that triggered the zap had been a cler clerical mistake and a memo was then sent to employees that homosexuality would not be a criterion for denying a taxi license. And I'd like to point out, this is a symbolic couch, not the historic couch. Nearly three and a half years after Stonewall, the LGBT community was still suffering from mistreatment by the New York City Police Department, including widespread harassment, refusal to come to the aid of LGBT people when it was actually needed, and the use of obsolete sodomy and solicitation solicitation laws. They then led a demonstration at the police headquarters downtown, which was said to be the first such protest at that location. The diverse crowd also included Mattachine Society New York, the Gay Alliance of Brooklyn, Gay Activists Alliance New Jersey, and a number of democratic groups. In summarizing, um, GAA continued to hold ZAPs for a few more years, and the group lasted with diminishing um, influence until 1981. But it significantly helped to define and highlight many of the issues confronting the LGBT community in the 1970s and provided a new model for political activism. A number of, of GAA's leaders um, formed the National Gay Task Force in 1973 which took a lot of these issues and political activism to a national level. And ACT UP, which was formed in 1987, um, obviously took from their, the GA's playbook um, many, uh, many events that were incredibly media savvy. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> um, I just want to Thank Jay, because it was an awful lot of research to compile this information and to connect it to specific sites. Um, as you know, we're a preservation project, so we are interested in the places that uh, embed this history and where these locations um, sort of could put, be put together um, contextually in throughout New York City. So it's an awful lot of work to do that. Um, on the connection that you just made to ACT UP, um, and the earlier zaps, um, there was a question that came in from Ari who asked, are any groups today using this type of theatrical technique um, like the zap uh, that we know about? Um, I don't know if anyone in, you know, in the attending it knows about that, but I can't think of anyone now that's using a similar type of confrontational technique to embarrass people and shame them. Um, if Jay, are you familiar with any of that? I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, oh, gag, Chef, Chef, my good old friend, Chef. That's true. Gag, gays against gun is guns yeah. are doing that. So that's a really great connection. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Chef. <clears throat> and Ken, um, that raises also. I, I really have not had a chance to look into it. You had asked if anybody prior to GAA. Um, the one parallel that I thought about after you raised that and. I don't even know precisely the time frame, but the Yippies, um, in terms of leftist groups, was was doing very theatrical mm -hmm. um, media events um, back uh, probably around this exact same time. And what Jay's alluding to, I was asking Jay when we were doing a run through, you know, was this something that was inspired by Marty Robinson and you know on their own, or was there a precedent with radical lesbians or the new left? Um, so we're trying to actually make connections to past ideas, but I think Jay 
there's, it's much more research needs to be done. Again, if you have questions about anything or comments, please send them through the chat function. Um, one question I have, Jay, is, you know, we're hearing about Lindsay. We knew there was a strategy. We knew there was a gay rights bill. And I don't think you've delved into it as deep, but was there a real strategy amongst, you know, GAA and GLF, how they mapped out the zaps or the, were they more reactive rather than proactive? Well, from what I can figure out, it, it seems that it was, it was both. I mean, clearly they, they, in, you know, um, for all the audience out there, we're planning on posting all of these sites on our website. Um, um, and, you know, much, much, much longer text. They clearly set out that um, Lindsay and other politicians that they considered being impediments for their lack of action and their silence and everything that they were going to target them every public appearance they made. So that's a, that's a proactive thing. But a number of the zaps that I did hear clearly were GAA members or people who weren't that alerted them to the discrimination that they were facing in the real world, like the guy who tried to get a taxi license and told that he needed to have a psychiatric examination just to drive a taxi. So that was a reaction to that. They also clearly were getting dozens of complaints from guys who were living at the Y, the Upper West Side Y. So it, it was a combination. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, there are a bunch of questions coming through. Um, one is a comment by Shep that, um, you know, it's odd that GA Day disbanded just as the, you know, AIDS epidemic was coming to New York City and hit the community. And it's a, it's a really kind of poignant observation. Um, there's another question about the uh, Diego Vanellis who uh, jumped, uh, I believe he's talking about, who jumped at the snake pit. Diego Vanellis was the person that was impaled on the wrought iron. Um, we don't, no one knows what happened to him. There's been a lot of research but uh, you know, apparently, he the, lived. The only the only person that really tried when uh, when David Carter was researching his book, he really tried to find out what happened to him, and if mm. he gave up. So. Oh, and there's there is there, there's some questions coming up about how interracial racial the zaps were, um, and as Jay said at the beginning, uh, originally. Uh, a lot of the, the leaders were um, white cisgendered men as we categorize them now. But Hal Wiener, who commented to everybody, is a founding general counsel of GAA, which is oh, wonderful wow. to have you here, um, and said the Zaps were interracial only if Star showed up with Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, Vivi, um, and Natasha especially, which is a really interesting comment. And, uh, and we should speak to Hal after this to get this information. But, it, but again, the, the one photograph that I showed that was at the Republican headquarters, um, I don't know that those guys there were, but. And there was a question if Bayard Rustin was um, involved in GAA at all. Um, you know, yes, he lived in Penn South, which is just adjacent to Holy Apostle. Um, not to our knowledge. Um, I don't think Jay or Amanda or Andrew have come across any connection. We could certainly ask Walter Nagel, his surviving partner husband. Right, and, and uh, Hal is saying that Bayard was, Bayard Rustin was very important to the Workers' Defense League. Um, my gosh, we should really speak to you, Mr. Wiener. Or, um, and we should just, as an aside, um, Bayard Rustin's apartment was listed on the National Register related to his work um, as part of, you know, credited with the project. So it's one of the, um, I think New York City, New York State leads with the number of National Register nominations associated with LGBT history. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, Amanda, or Andrew, I think there are 21 nominated sites in New York State, which leads the, um, the rest of the country. Although Donna Graves is here from California and has worked on numerous National Register nominations and a context statement for LGBT history in California in Los Angeles. So she may be able to correct me. San Francisco. San Francisco, I'm sorry, right.
Um, there was a question about Marty Robinson and uh, was he, you know, he's not that well known in terms of LGBT history. Did he continue to be a gay activist? Jay, I think you can answer that. I, I, I haven't had any occasion to track mm -hmm. after these years, but. Um, there's a question about the radical fairies um, who had a, their separate gay pride event. Um, part of the original parade. Uh, this is a, a more of a comment than a question. So uh, they were engaged with a number of activities and supportive demands. Yes, radical fairies who have a long trajectory of history um, and, and sort of advocating um, in a very principled way. <clears throat> There's also a question if Jackie Hermona was involved in GAA. Um, I don't know. Uh, in, I don't know if anyone who's attending here um, has that information. Um, the, and then we have certain uh, the comments. Uh, oh, Jay, there's a question specifically. Explain the rift within the YMCA. The, I guess you know what what if there's any more to expand on that. There's a question from Eric, and maybe Eric, if, is there something specific that you want to know? It was really about surveillance and harassment of gay people who were staying there. Well, again, I mean, it was just extraordinarily homophobic policies. If, if, if what I say, they had case files of a thousand men who had been ejected out of staying there. And uh, Jerry G let me know that Marty Robinson was a fan, an active member of ACT UP, which I did not know about that at all. I didn't realize that either. Yeah. Um, there's a question from George Benson. I don't know if we really have the answer about the, theatria, the, theatria, the theatricality of the Zaps. Uh, along with the humor, seems to be fundamental in their effectiveness. Why did the Zap instigators approach it from this direction rather than righteous anger or something like that? Um, did they necessarily have a theatrical background to sort of attend <laughs> those type of events? <laughs> that would be that would be interesting to know. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think people like Morty Manford necessarily did, or the, you know, um, but that would be. Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, which also begs the question for me, like, where did it come from? I'd love to go through the minutes and sort of learn more about that. And uh, again, the theatricality was absolute trigger to get media attention. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you think of the difference between, and I'm so glad that George um, pointed out the term humor, because I mean, what's more humorous than somebody walking around Times Square in a duck outfit and everybody squeezing squeezable ducks to attract attention, um, particularly because the head of that company had identified homosexuals with looking like ducks. Um, Um, it, Donna Graves is giving us a really good observation here in, in a bit of context. Theatricality and humor were relatively common to countercultural events. The diggers in San Francisco were emblematic of that, and their roots were in a San Francisco mine, uh, mime troupe. So that's, you know, it would be really great to be able to, you know, put together all these counterculture and um, sort of zap type of events um, throughout the country. Um, and it would be interesting to see if, like with GAG now, you know, why are they using them and how are they um, sort of strategizing about their use? Uh, and, and Shep is quoting Ann Northrup, who's been a long-term activist and uh, very active with ACT UP and the, the current um, resist, the re resist Parade, says if you're gay and an AIDS activist once said, if you're an activist, you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong then. That's great. Um, Mark Black is asking, was GAA involvement with the New York City passage of the Gay Rights Bill? I recall a sit-in at City Hall. Well, uh, I 
didn't get a chance to mention or it's going through this among the things that I didn't scoop into this, there were countless um, actions at City Hall that um, we'll be adding to the website. Um, we have City Hall Park already on the website. So that was one of the reasons I didn't look into them, but they were constantly, constantly, constantly down at City Hall trying to push along the gay rights bill. Um. I'm going to read uh, the, the uh, our, our friend from the of the project, Jared Spencer, has something from Marty Robinson's uh, New York Times obit, quoting: "Sometimes Mr. Robinson resorted to more conventional methods, like testifying before the Presidential Commission on AIDS in 1987. So I guess he had a wide-ranging um, sort of method of activism." Oh, Shep's asking during this period, where was GLF? Um, GLF had um, sort of shut up shop, you know, closed shop. Jay in what? Nineteen seventy. You know, I was with seventy something. Yeah, um, early, but before um, it, it ended. Soon after they moved to the Gay Community Center on Third Street, which closed, by the way, because somebody um, ran off with their funds. And if anyone, uh, Hal Weiner is, we had a big demonstration on the eve before the arguments of Intro 475 at at and World Headquarters on Lower uh, Broadway. Um, there's a really interesting question from Charles Kay. Um, and this goes to the complexity of our project and the challenges. Did any organizing occur in people's homes slash apartments? Have these been looked at for significance. Now, um, for example, yes, we are trying to um, identify um, locations where organizing took place. One such location would be, for example, Craig Rodwell's apartment at 350 Bleecker Street, where he, along with Fred Sargent, uh, Linda Rose, and Ellen Brody, planned this specific language for the what we're gonna be commemorating this next week, the first gay pride march. It was planned in Craig's apartment. Um, however, there, are, there must be so many more sites where people like Larry Kramer, you know, founding GMHC. Well, Ken, where, whose apartment was this that they were planning the Harper's out? <laughs> right, so exactly, Jay scrolled back to this. So, you know, yes, we are trying to track them, but no, we don't have the definitive list. This goes to the complexity of you know, documenting LGBT history and this type of history. If anyone has locations uh, of people's apartments, it, it, it also pertains to not just political organizing, but socializing, you know, where there are potluck suppers in people's apartments who were discriminated against, who could not go to bars or restaurants. Was there any type of rent parties? You know, we know these exist and so forth. So. And in the broader, broader thing, our project is putting a plug to everybody on here. If you have sites you want us to look into and nominate, please send them to us. Amanda, um, do we still I, have like 300 some sites in our database? Yes, we've got another, we've got about 200 and just under 270 or a little over 270 fully documented on our website and about 300 more on a database that we're addressing. Um, I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm just, it's a little, just forgive me here, I'm just trying to scroll up and look at questions while I'm talking at the same time. Um, there's a question, and I don't know if, if maybe someone who was there, such as Hal Weiner, can answer this. There's a question, I'm very curious about the, why the Zaps were interracial only in spe if specific people showed up. Was there a segregation feeling because of race, gender, trans, people of color didn't feel part of GAA? Um, well, part of the response to that, you have to think also, is, is the comfort level of people being out in public with the possibility of arrest. So it, there would be a number of factors here. Um, mm -hmm. um, Mark uh, has a question uh, from Glenn. Can you describe the New York public, uh, New York Police Department archival reports, surveillance records related to ZAPs? 
the only thing that I was made, I mean, of what we've looked at thus far, and if there was had been a way that we could have easily shown it, um, Ken Cobb, who's one of the commissioners of municipal archives, um, their police um, videos are now online. And when I did a search for that with, um, there's something like 11 police surveillance videos that are on the municipal archives website. Um, there are only two that are directly related to GAA and they're labeled the board of Edu of the board of examiners um, zap, but I think it's mislabeled because it's showing um, dark late at night uh, protest, um, which and some of the people that are inside are not the same ones that that led that event. But at any rate, um, a number of the other ones show GLF and pre JAA groups that were at anti-war marches, and they labeled them as gay because they had banners and so on, but there, there are 11 that are available on that website. Um, I was just gonna ask Hal, if you're comfortable talking, if you wanna add anything to this, since you were so involved, um, give me a, a thumbs up and we can unmute you if you'd like to make any comments. Um, and in the interim, there's another question. I don't think um, anyone on, from the project team would know, does the name Mrs. Clear Plastic or Clearer Ring, uh, Clearer Ring a bell for us to anyone here? Not, no, not to anyone on our team. Um, well, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, I'm gonna sort of pitch it back to Andrew to just talk about our upcoming event and to sort of make a plug for our t-shirts. Uh, yes, so, so for those of you who uh, weren't here at the beginning, I, I want to invite you all to come to our, our final June event, which is uh, on Thursday, June 25th, where we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of, of the first gay pride parade with a discussion about uh, the planning of the parade and about Greenwich Village. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you uh, at that event. And I also invite everybody as part of the celebration of this, uh, of the, this parade or this march uh, to, to get one of our t-shirts, which are the poster uh, that was handmade for the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. Uh, and um, it's, we're selling them as a benefit uh, for our uh, for for our project, uh, so it's uh, buy one for yourself and give it as gifts to all your friends. Thanks a lot for coming tonight. Thanks, I, and I just want to add one last comment because um, Rick Landman, who was very has been very active over the past years and years, mentioned that Mark Siegel of GLF was doing similar zaps in media events and even locked himself in the TV, uh, to the TV camera on, an, on the news or a Donahue show. So, you know, what we're, a lot of this, uh, what we're talking about is GAA, but, you know, before GLF sort of disbanded, they were also involved in these actions, um, as were, you know, support from the Mattachine Daughters of Elitis and these early pre-Stonewall um, LGBT activist organizations. Oh, Hal can't, um, um, if anyone wants to stay with us, we're gonna, Hal can't unmute himself, Christiana, but I mean, this formal part of the program is over just in keeping with everybody's time, it's 7.33, but if you want to stay, uh, we can unmute Hal and he can add some firsthand primary source knowledge. <clears throat> I think I'm unmuted, I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, Mark Siegel and Harry Langhorn streak the Walter Cronkite News Hour, not uh, not uh, the other show. And what happened was he they got arrested at CBS, and I got a phone call to come down there. Did you know CBS has its own jail? No kidding. <laughs> the basement of the building. It's a very nice jail cell. It's built to regular police jail cell standard, and so they're in there. And I come in there and uh, talking to them and uh, setting up uh, an arraignment when they're going down to central booking. And in comes Chris Borgen, 
who had been a uh, detective and was the anchor man on the 11 o'clock news. And he said to me, uh, would you please keep them for a while? Because I'd like to interview them on the 11 o'clock news about why they street Walter Cronkite. And I said, sure, uh, thinking ahead. And then uh, <laughs> we went to court and I said, I have a defense. And the judge said, you do? I said, yes. I said, they're business invitees. They're not trespassing. I said, uh, they, they stayed there at the request of the anchor man on the 11 o'clock news. Nice try. Didn't work. <laughs> Thanks. It's <laughs> great. Um, well, I think on that note, we're going to end the formal presentation. Thank you for all coming. Please join us on June 25th. Check us out on social media, check our website, and um, we look forward to a happy pride and some good news from yesterday's Supreme Court decision, which should lift our spirits and recognize the significance of LGBT activism from the first uh, action in New York City in 1964, which had about five or six people, to the event in Brooklyn on Sunday, which had 15,000. So that should give you some spirited um, enthusiasm. Thanks, everybody.